And it was last Thursday we saw the price of palladium and platinum. Who would, and platinum's been showing life lately with some very stiff up days. And it was, you know, the, the, the COMEX market opens at 8.20 Eastern time in the morning every day, every business day. And when, when the COMEX market opened last Thursday, you can go and look at it on a historical chart. The, the price of palladium was hit. The minute, the minute the market opened, the price had been stable all through the night in the Far Eastern markets. And at 8.20 when the COMEX opened, the price of palladium immediately plunged over $200. And the price of platinum collapsed by $50, which are huge, huge percentage moves. Uh, the palladium market basically, within, within minutes of being plugged, the palladium market rebounded to, but I mean, the, the drop on the chart was dramatic and, and, it, and it, was, it was symbolic of an assassination, okay? Now, you know, we, we, we talk about, and, and you, see, you hear it in the news, how the Iranian uh, general was assassinated uh, or taken out with a drone. Well, I'm going to tell you that last Thursday, the platinum and the palladium markets were droned, okay, at 820, the second that the COMEX opened. And that is criminal activity. I can't say when normalcy will reign again in our capital markets, but all I can tell you is that it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Uh, normalcy will return at some point. And when it does, there will be hell to pay. And when there's hell to pay, it's best you're positioned for it. Because this, this event, which will come, you can afford to be 20 minutes early, a day early, three days early, a week or a month early. But if you're one minute late, you're toast. Welcome back to Finance and Liberty and Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest who is phenomenally popular with our viewers. Rob Kirby, the founder of Kirby Analytics, is with us again. This is Thursday, January 23rd, 2020. Rob, thanks for joining us again. Uh, pleasure to be with you again, Dunnigan. Before we get to some viewers' questions, I wanted you to weigh in on some extraordinarily unconventional things that are going on in the worlds of economy and finance. Specifically, we've seen after this whole... Uh, kerfuffle with uh, Iran just a, a few weeks ago. We've seen oil, the price of oil shoot sky high as well as gold, and then uh, oil, oil at least coming down very sharply over the past uh, week plus here. And we also see uh, major stock market indices just repeatedly pounding on all-time highs, although starting to seem like maybe they're rolling over in the past week here. And uh, a lot of other very strange and unconventional things going on out there. Wonder if you could just walk us through, from your vantage point, what you're seeing in these macro uh, situations and what you think uh, we people need to be aware of, and why you think these things might not be on people's radars, and why they're unusual enough to be paying attention to. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know where exactly you want to start, but. Uh... As to why pe people have been lulled into a sense of uh, everything will be okay, we have situations where the financial purveyors like uh, CNBC, uh, Bloomberg News, or Bloomberg Business News, they, they keep pounding us with the hopium or the happy juice on a daily basis that, you know, the stock market's looking great. Uh, and, 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 and things only, only look like they're ever going to get better. New all-time highs on stock market indices. And, I mean, and from that standpoint, Dunnigan, we even have the president who is the, one of the biggest cheerleaders I've ever seen for the stock markets in the history of stock markets. Um, so, I mean, the, the, like, you know, I've, I, I've read, for instance, Dunnigan, that the amount of money that Apple's making today is the same dollar value is what they made in 2012 yet the stock is like five times the price 
That's one of the so, things that was occurring to me today. I was really <laughs> reflecting on this, these runaway markets. It's like, and why would the president would be, you know, beating the drum for, oh, we want higher markets and higher markets. It's like, wait a minute. If you're the president of a people and you want your country to be prosperous, wouldn't you be concerned about the productivity and the actual value creation of the companies and the organizations in the economy? Why would you be, why would you care so much about beating the drum about some, the, the stock price? That shouldn't, that shouldn't well, be your primary concern. You know, the, I mean, the reason, the reason why, at least in my view, Dunnigan, the reason why we have people cheerleading for the stock market is that an extraordinary amount of money is being printed, a lot more than is being acknowledged, and it's finding its way into uh, into our equity markets and into basically the stock market valuations, which is why a company can be earning the same amount of money today as it earned in 2012, and yet its stock price is five times, you know, the value today as it was in 2012, and. The, the the way I like to metaphorically explain what's happening, you see, when when you have when you have a tube of toothpaste or or let's just say a body of money that exists in our financial system, and when when you keep when you keep adding more and more, put more and more in the tube, and then and then if you could imagine welding welding the cap on really tight, and you 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 put the tube on the ground and you stomp on it with with a boot, and you know, if if the if, the, if the, the contents of the tube can't make it out through through the natural opening that's been welded shut, you're going to have ruptures. You're going to have ruptures in the body of the tube, and it will come out, and it'll come out in a very, let's just say, a very erratic fashion. And er, erratic and upward is what what I what I or how I would characterize our stock markets at the moment. And 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 the two and the top of the tube being welded shut is basically the precious metals markets, which which is where historically that's where the big gush would have come. The, the big gush of money that's being forced into the system would have naturally expressed itself in you know in a rise in precious metals uh, prices. And and the funny thing is, to a point we're kind of sort of seeing it. But we're only seeing it, for instance, really express itself in, pal in the palladium market. And the reason why we're seeing it express itself in the palladium market, Dunnigan, is because the palladium market is so tiny, they basically don't have a viable futures market for palladium. So, you see, anything in the world that doesn't have a big underlying futures complex uh, uh, is, is going up in record prices. You know, and I, like I've mentioned this recently in another interview, look look at the prices of fine art. And, you know, I pay close attention to fine art, the fine art market. Um, I always like to pay attention, like what antique cars are going for or super valuable cars and fine art. And especially when it's at auction, because they'll often give commentary that they had an expectation of X, but it sold for double X or triple X. And the reason the fine art market, the fine art market is actually a really, really great uh, barometer for how much money there is in the system. You know, when you, when you hear people say that, you know, credit conditions are tight and there's no money around, but record prices are being paid in the fine art uh, community, uh, you know that there's lots of money. So the, uh, the empirical evidence isn't consistent with the narrative that we're being fed. And the, the reason why the precious metals markets, gold and silver, have been stifled is because they have vast futures complexes uh, where paper gold and paper silver are being sold in record amounts. Because, and, and this is expressed through the open interest on exchanges like the COMEX, where, where hideous amounts of, of uh, futures contracts are being sold to keep the price of gold and silver uh, you know, as as we're told, it is uh, is is just hammered on a daily basis with gobs and gobs and gobs of, of paper promises of the underlying. Uh, that doesn't work so well in the palladium market because, like I say, that that market is so tiny. It's basically a cash and carry market. It's more reflective of the fine art market than it is of the gold and silver market because of its size. Uh, but all that being said. They do still trade somewhat in paper form or in future form, 
And it was last Thursday we saw the price of palladium and platinum. Who would, and platinum's been showing life lately with some very stiff up days. And it was, you know, the, the, the COMEX market opens at 8.20 Eastern time in the morning every day, every business day. And when, when the COMEX market opened last Thursday, you can go and look at on a historical chart. The, the price of palladium was hit. The minute, the minute the market opened, the price had been stable all through the night in the Far Eastern markets. And at 820, when the COMEX opened, the price of palladium immediately plunged over $200. And the price of platinum collapsed by $50, which are huge, huge percentage moves. Uh, the palladium market basically, within, within minutes of being plugged, the palladium market rebounded to... But, I mean, the, the drop on the chart was dramatic, and, and, it, and it, was, it was symbolic of an assassination, okay? Now, you know, we, we, we talk about, and, and you, see, you hear it in the news, how the Iranian uh, general was assassinated uh, or taken out with a drone. Well, I'm going to tell you that last Thursday, the platinum and the palladium markets were droned, okay, at 8.20, the second that the COMEX opened. And that is criminal activity, okay? And if we had regulators like the CFTC, the Commodity Futures and Trading Commission, who is supposed to regulate the, uh, the activities on the COMEX, if they were actually doing their job and weren't derelicts in their, in, in their uh, you know, uh, oversight, uh, there would be criminal investigations into that, to, to that incident alone. But instead, there's nothing and there's silence. And this is the same type of uh, activity that goes on time and time again in the gold and silver markets. And the reason why this, like there, there is commodities law that says that this shouldn't occur. But the reason why the regulators look the other way and don't regulate is because the perpetrator of these uh, manhandling events in, in the metals is at the behest of the government itself. It's, it's the U.S. Treasury acting through the Exchange Stabilization Fund, a secretive adjunct to the Treasury, who operates through the New York Federal Reserve Trading Desk, who disseminates orders to assassinate the prices of things that are considered to be historic alternatives uh, to the dollar when the, when the dollar is being debased or diminished in its uh, in its ability to perform its function. So this is what's going on. This is in the metals arena. I mean, but then we've got then we've got the crude oil market where we had the uh, where we had the assass assassination of the Iranian general, which immediately through the uh, through the energy markets, the crude oil market into a tizzy and prices rocketed up very dramatically. But then but then when we didn't get the uh, onset of World War III, mm -hmm. the crude oil markets, uh, you know, price declined back to and lower than where they were before the incident. And to that, I'm going to say, you know, 18 months ago, Dunnigan, uh, we had America producing, or not even 18 months, let's say eight or nine months ago, America was producing 12 and a half million barrels of oil a day. And today, America is producing 13 million dollar or 13 million barrels of oil a day. So American production has gone up another 500,000 barrels per day in the last eight or nine months. And all of that, all of that marginal increase has come from shale oil. Okay, and shale oil needs a minimum a minimum price of 50, I'm going to say 56 dollars or thereabouts for them to be profitable, to, to make money producing oil from shale. Uh, shale oil production is expensive. Um, and so let's just say like with the closing prices, I believe today, or we were down around 55 bucks again today on West Texas Intermediate Oil. That means that every, every barrel of oil basically that's being produced out of the shale fields is being produced at a loss, okay? And, and the reason this is all happening, the reason why oil prices have fallen back is because global, the global economy is slowing down. 
and you know we have a we have a global economy that's slowing or rolling over and uh, economic activity has decreased which means the world doesn't need as much oil today as it did eight or nine months ago uh, and and yet the supply continues to increase and a big part of the reason why America is producing the oil that they are is because when they sell it, it creates demand for dollars. Because anybody who buys oil from America has to pay for it in dollars. People who are buying oil from Russia are paying in either rubles or euro, but not dollars. And uh, so this has created a huge problem for the, let's just say for the petrodollar and its and its support system, which is all geared around people paying for oil in dollars, and it's a very big problem for the powers that be that crude oil or a lot of crude oil now in the world is being priced in other than dollars. I want to ask you a follow-up question on something you mentioned about the record high stock markets, and now you're talking about the dollars. Um, inflation is a political hot topic. Um, it's it's. No sitting president would want to be blamed for causing or their policies uh, being present on their watch of, of high inflation. Um, so, is it the case? Is it is it asking? Is it saying too much to say that like the record high stock markets that Trump keeps beating the drum about is like the only politically correct point you can point to and say, "Hey, look at that! That's a great thing," even though it's just inflation. In other words, if if it's not if it's not uh, values and not fundamentals yeah. that are driving the price up. Well, done again. The you know in 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 the in the nomenclature of the, of the deep state or, or the powers that be who really run the world, uh, uh, increasing stock markets uh, or stock index levels isn't considered inflation. That's 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 considered prosperity. Uh -huh. I mean. You know, if if the Dow if the Dow Jones were to double in value between now and August, they would they would they would only beat their chests and say that they're, they're, the measures they've taken have you know brought more prosperity to more people, and you know which means we should carry on with the policies that have gotten mm -hmm. us to where we are, and and I mean as as long as they don't you know as long as they can keep the keep the gold price suppressed by having the open interest maybe double or triple or quadruple again from where it is today, that would all be okay as far as they're concerned. Um, you know, but I mean, it's, it, I mean, if you, if you want, and if you want there to be no inflation, all you have to do done again is not count the things that went up, went up in price. And that's basically the, 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 the measurements of inflation that we are fed the narrative on in the main in the main or by the mainstream yeah. financial press basically eliminates things that have gone up in value and of course in their basket of things that they measure the, the stock market the value of the stock market isn't one of them so the stock market's free to do you know whatever it wants so long as they print more money and that's all good uh, but if, if, if anything in the basket actually goes up in value, it, they still find a way to eliminate it from the basket. I mean, in, inflation, when it was first started to be measured, included food and energy. Food and energy. And, and I'm just thinking about medical costs and higher education, between food, energy, medical costs, and higher education, and the cost of shelter, of, of, of house, you know, apartments or houses. Is Yeah. <laughs> It's the things people actually well, need. You see, those those are things. I mean, they they have, they do put in. I believe something that's a, that they it's 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 a measure that they say equates to the cost of housing, but it's but it's so heavily manipulated. It's you know it's it's sort of like the the component that they use to represent housing in the in the inflation basket. Is about as meaningful as saying the price the price of gold hasn't gone up, hmm. uh, therefore there's not a problem with the money. I mean, if you you know if you manipulate the price of gold, uh, uh, you can keep it under wraps, and if you manipulate the measurement that stands for the cost of housing, you know you know like you could if if the price of a of a, of a livable home goes up, then they can substitute it with 
you know, with with a sewer. Uh, you know, they can they can put a front door on a sewer, and they could say, well, this 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 is a home. It's like if the, like in the food in with food, if the they'll substitute things in and out of the food basket. Yeah, like I mean, if the price of hamburger goes up too much, they'll replace it with cat food. You know, and th these are the kind of they're they're referred to as hedonic adjustments they make when they're taking uh, uh, samples for things that they measure to express what inflation is. And of course, there are alternative measures to the official government uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, measures of inflation, whether it's John Williams and shadow stats. Uh, they, they measure, uh, John Williams, for instance, measures inflation in a much different way uh, then the officialdom measure is is calculated because I mean John John Williams at Shadow Stats when he measures inflation he measures it the way it used to be measured in 1980 and I mean if you measure inflation the way it was measured in 1980 we probably have a 10 percent inflation rate right now but instead they say it's a record low at what whatever it is 1.7 or 1.8 percent and uh, and and it and it just makes people who are consuming or heavy, heavy consumers of mainstream financial news, uh, it, it, it sort of lulls them into a, into a sense of apathy. But, I mean, the, we, we know there's inflation because we know that the Fed is printing. And then there's also the additional uh, consideration of, uh, you know, 21 trillion missing from two, 1998 to 2015, as reported by... Uh, and documented very well by Catherine Fitz and Dr. Mark Skidmore. And then there's, then there's a, a new release yesterday just dealing with the Department of Defense saying that in the last year, the Department of Defense had $35 trillion of unsupported uh, accounting uh, uh, moves. So this, this, like, I mean, think about what I just said. They, they're, they're admitting that there's $35 trillion worth of unsupported, uh, and they only have a budget annually of whatever it was, record high last year, I think $727 billion is their annual, but somehow there's $35 trillion in, in unsupported uh, you know, accounting charges. So how, how this happens and how, and how they're... How they're can't be fraud involved in this is absolutely and utterly beyond, beyond uh, comprehension. But these are the kind of numbers that, that are actually being published, okay, by reputable journalists who are looking at the books. And, 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 and the books and the books are heavily, heavily, uh, you know, as it is, they're heavily redacted now. Because, I mean, with the passage of FASB 56, the, the United States federal government has actually been excused from reporting accurate financials uh, if it's deemed to be in the interest of national security. So, I mean, we have, we're confronting a host of issues. We're confronting, uh, and then the, the, the next beauty, uh, which, which we talked about before we actually started the interview, uh, there was an announcement or a press release from the European Central Bank yesterday and I'm just going to read you the first uh, couple sentences of that. The Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, the RICS Bank, and the Swiss National Bank, together with the Bank for International Settlements, have created a group to share experiences as they assess the potential cases for central bank digital currencies in their home jurisdictions. So... Can you say how long before we have a global crypto regime in place? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what that meant. And when I was sent that uh, headline with a link to the press release on the European Central Bank's website, I sent a notice to all my subscribers, uh, you know, notifying them that this, this had actually been uh, press released. And last night, that story was taken down off the European Central Bank site. And 
it it remained down till about mid afternoon today, and then it reappeared, and and it's back up there now. But I mean, these are the kind of shenanigans uh, that are going on, and when you think about that ECB press release regarding digital currencies, that that intuitively should have been extremely crypto uh, bullish, should have been extremely dollar negative, should have been extremely bullish for the price of metals. And so so what did we get after that after that quite dramatic press release? Well, we saw Bitcoin have the worst day it's had in two weeks. We saw the price of metals barely hold their head above water today. Silver down a bit, gold up a tiny bit. The dollar strengthened. I mean, these 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 moves in markets are all completely 100% counterintuitive. Okay, it, it's 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 sort of like it's sort of like throwing it's sort of like throwing a Roman candle into an ammo hut and closing the door and. And instead of there being an explosion, tulips start growing out of the window. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. It's completely and utterly ridiculous, and it's counterintuitive. Mm. And you know what? And it's and, and this kind this kind of crap and activity is not sustainable long term. And then, of course, the question becomes: Okay, Rob, well, when is the long term? I don't know. I can't say when normalcy will reign again in our capital markets, but. All I can tell you is that it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Uh, normalcy will return at some point, and when it does, there will be hell to pay. And when there's hell to pay, it's best you're positioned for it, because this this event, which will come, you can afford to be 20 minutes early, a day early, three days early, a week or a month early. But if you're one minute late, you're toast. So that's the way it's going to play out, I believe, in the end, which is why you've got to keep your keep your helmet on and keep your nose to the grindstone and and and, and maintain a a a course that's reflective of probity and and you know intelligence, intelligent thought. And pay attention to what's going on around you, and not the noise you're getting from the mainstream financial press. Yeah, speaking of that, <clears throat> as an alternative to the mainstream financial press is independent media and independent voices. You are a proprietary analyst. Um, we want to always remind people if they've been getting value from these broadcasts, they need to support yep. our mission at patreon.com slash reluctant preppers or paypal.me slash reluctant preppers so that we're not dependent on Google slash YouTube for, to cut off our funding supply so that we would disappear. Yep. And where can they find you and make sure that they're supporting your independent work as well? Yeah, well, you know what, Dunnigan, on that front, I've actually, I've actually put for the first time in my life, I don't advertise, I don't uh, sell products on my site, but I've actually put a donate button on my site. Uh, just went up today. Uh, because I'm finding it financially very difficult to maintain my way in, in, in this environment. And, uh, you know, I've shouldered a lot of costs for a long time. And if anybody feels like they can uh, and, and can help support, uh, there's a donate button on the site. And uh, I, I'm not going to make a practice of begging for money. But if anybody feels that they can help or get value out of anything that I add to the, uh, you know, to the fracas, then by all means, please do. It's it's all appreciated. Anything anyone can throw in. It's hard to be a stand-up guy in an upside-down world because you keep bumping it, your head on the floor. <clears throat> you know, Dunnigan, all I can tell you is there's not a lot of money in truth. <laughs> well, hopefully there's a lot of money. What I'm trying to say is hopefully there's a lot of support in numbers, strength in numbers, and together we are unstoppable is what I've been reminding our viewers. So. Yeah. Um, there was one thing you mentioned in our pre-talk about this topic of upside down world that you didn't uh, recap just now, and that is the Fed uh, bond repo anomaly. What's going on there? Can you talk to us about what's upside yeah. down about that? Well, I mean, yesterday, for instance, the Fed recommenced its purchase of U.S. government debt uh, coupons from six months up to two years. They did 9.3 billion 
in outright purchases of any in anything from six months. It was it was a series of different U.S. government securities, but it was nine nine point three billion in outright purchases, and that's on top of the uh, well publicized sixty billion a month that they're already buying in six month uh, U.S. government six month T bills that they're, that they're monetizing. Uh, you know, we saw two rounds of repo today. Uh, we saw, I think it was 30 billion in 14-day repos, and, and 42 billion in uh, overnight overnight repos, and, and 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 a huge amount of these repo uh, issuances or activities on a daily basis happened to be like I think today there was 43 billion in in repo activity split between overnight and 14-day. Uh, I think it was 43 billion. It was a very significant amount. More, I think it was half or more than half of all the repo activity was in mortgage-backed securities. So I don't really understand. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I can think of reasons why this is so, but I mean, uh, who who is loaded up with mortgage paper to? To the point where they they have no liquidity, and, and they need and they basically need to uh, get it financed on a daily basis. Um, you know, I mean, in in my mind, this reeks of the notion that the world is full, too full of U.S. government or U.S. denominated debt. There's no appetite globally for additional U.S. denominated debt. Period. And uh, this is why the Federal Reserve is effectively monetizing debt, because they are and are by definition the buyer of last resort. And when nobody else will touch it with a barge pole, the Fed steps up and they and they and they buy. And that's what they've been doing. And you know this whole this whole concept of this repo scheme which first reared its head back in September. It was explained to us lumpen that this was all about getting banks over the year end because banks typically at year end have to square their books and it's it's a big bums rush to, for banks to square their books over year end and that's why we were told prior to year end why there was such a, a huge requirement for them to put liquidity in the system. Well, let's just say, and because I said it before Christmas, I said, aren't people going to be surprised? Because this this repo activity prior to the year end and before Christmas, they were saying, you know, this will heighten for year end and then it should dissipate somewhat as we move into January, the middle of January. Well, guess what? You know, before Christmas, they said, it's going to be something when we get to mid-January or late January when, when this hasn't dissipated at all. And instead, the amount of liquidity being added to the system is vectoring up. Well, that's exactly what's occurring. So, and the reason it's occurring down again is because this this is going back to another topic that, that I've tried to express on, on, in interviews with you many times. We are experiencing basically it's I, I'm going to call it a crack up boom. Uh, Chris Martinson has explained in, in, a, in an area on his website, Peak Prosperity, there, there's, there's a link on, on his homepage to Crash Course. And it's a video series, probably take you an hour and change to watch it all. But if you do watch it, you will see that what Martinson explains is the life cycle of uh, uh, fiat money with compound interest. And the life cycle of fiat money with compound interest is that it grows in the beginning at a very shallow upward uh, in an upward direction to the right until it reaches an inflection point and whether or not it reaches an inflection point isn't a concern uh, or it or isn't open for question it because mathematics dictates you see and the reason math dictates this done again in, in a in a in a in a debt based fiat money system, money all money is loaned into existence. Okay, so money isn't created technically really out of thin air, except it kind of sort of is out of thin air, because uh, as long as as long as there's somebody who's willing to bid for the new debt, uh, 
you know, the game continues. So, and if there are no natural buyers of the debt, then the Fed can become the buyer of the debt. But when the new debt is purchased, the interest payments that are going to be due on the debt aren't created at the same time. Okay, so that what that means is, so if you create if you create a hundred billion dollars worth of new money, you issue a hundred billion dollars worth of bonds. But when you do that, you haven't produced the uh, two billion that's going to be required to retire the debt to pay the interest, which means that you must continue to grow the money. And if you stop growing the money, then the system collapses because you can't retire the maturing debt, which basically means you're, you're, you're running a pyramid scheme, mm -hmm. okay? And you have to keep increasing the amount of money. And math dictates that as you keep creating more and more and more of this that bears interest, and I'll give people a hint, that's a big part of the reason why the European Central Bank has $17 trillion worth of negative yielding debt, okay? Uh, and America doesn't because America can't, because there's a paradox embedded in the uh, American financial system or the dollarized financial system that prevents American rates from going negative. And I'll get to that in a minute. But in any case, so what happens, and, and Martinson, Chris Martinson explains this very well in this crash course. Mathematics dictates that you reach an inflection point because even if interest rates are low, you reach an inflection point where money growth has to go parabolically, vertically up. We're on that part of the curve now with the U.S. dollar. And the reason why America can't have, I, I, you know, I got a query on this, I believe from an interview I did with you where I said we, America can't have negative rates. And I actually got queried on that by Ellen Brown, who's, who's, a, who's a brilliant writer. And she said to me, uh, you know, I, I, I got into a debate with somebody. This is back a couple of weeks ago. She said, I got into a debate with somebody. And I said, well, you know, Rob Kirby says that, you know, U.S. rates can't go negative. Uh, and I don't really understand the methodology of that. And as I explained to her, the, the, the euro dollar, the euro does not have a massive, massive multi-hundred trillions uh, interest rate derivatives complex underneath it. The dollar does. You see, and an interest rate in, in an interest rate swap, um, uh, when interest rate swaps of duration uh, two years or actually any interest rate swap, you have a payer at a, of a fixed rate, and you have a receiver. The, the person who pays fixed has to receive a floating rate, and the floating rate is three month LIBOR. The fixed the fixed rate is is a number, okay. And even if even if even if a bond like so, so you basically you've got you've got somebody paying fixed, and their compensation for paying that fixed rate is they receive the floating rate. So what happens if three month LIBOR goes negative? If you if you can think your way through this, so let's just say we got a ten year bond at one one seventy yield. So if I do a 10-year swap, I'm going to pay maybe, maybe uh, even if I'm paying 20 basis points under the 10-year, because spreads can go negative. If I pay, if I'm paying, uh, if I do a 10-year swap at 20 under, okay, so if you assume that the 10-year yield is 170, then I, on my fixed rate side of the trade, I'm going to pay 150, which would be 20 basis points under 170, which okay. is the current yield. But on the floating side, I'm going to receive three-month LIBOR. Well, if three-month LIBOR is negative 50 points, that means I'd be paying twice. And which means every bank, every bank, that, that would mean and imply Morgan, JP Morgan, Citi, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, and Goldman Sachs would immediately be insolvent. Because that, it's a it's a paradox. Mm -hmm. That's but that's why U.S. rates won't go negative, and they can't go negative for that reason. It creates a paradox in the derivatives market, and until the derivatives market goes away, it can't happen. But that is why it's happening. Because you see, the 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 European Central Bank and and the people who run the euro, they don't want to get into the same jackpot that America's in. 
So they don't have this massive uh, interest rate derivatives complex to create the paradox for the euro, which is why you can have euro uh, you can have eurozone debt trading at negative yields. But that can't it won't work for America, and it can't. And and if people have trouble coming to grips with or understanding that, all I can tell you is if you think it through and it. Like I, I worked in these markets. I used to I used to broker these trades between the biggest players in the world, and and I can I can tell you and assure you there's a paradox there, and it and, and it, it, can, it can't happen and it can't be allowed to happen for that reason. So we're stuck with positive rates, and uh, I mean we we could still get closer to zero. I'm not saying we can't have lower rates. We probably will have lower rates. They'll be mandated or forced down, but I don't believe they're going to go negative. Not the floating rates, anyway. Three-month LIBOR is not going to go negative. But the other thing I mentioned, too, on top of this, or as an adjunct to this, there's been a lot of talk in markets about trying to replace LIBOR with something else. Right. And all I can tell you is that the legal quagmire it would, it would <clears throat> create if this was actually seriously attempted to, to being brought to fruition, I don't. I think it's a non-starter. I think there would be too many lawsuits, and the whole and the whole governance of, of interest rate derivatives would have to be rewritten, which would be a legal minefield and nightmare. And I just I just don't think that's a dog that hunts at all. I don't think it can be done. So. And if, if somebody if somebody figures out a way to resolve this paradox, uh, they're, they're operating on a much much higher pay grade than I am, and uh, and and with a, and with a different and a different brain because I don't believe I don't believe it can be done. Well, you've been describing a quite a broad minefield. <laughs> it's got many different dimensions to it. I guess if we could rotate into some viewers' questions or something related sure. to stuff you've been talking sure. about. Um, Andrew R., and this gets back to what you and I were talking about, about how long can a person hold on who's who's committed to keeping their feet on the ground and their mind clear and only dealing with things that are where up is up and down is down. Andrew R. says, Rob, how can the middle class accumulate real money, gold and silver, and hang on to it securely long enough to realize its true value when the very nature of this evil cabal is exterminating our, exterminating our ability to survive financially in any meaningful way? What good is it if you're living in a car or a tent and you don't want to convert to fiat yet? I, I mean, it's a great question. And I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's... And the the answer to it is to is to I, I think the answer to it is to speak out. I mean, most of us have been browbeaten into, and, and this this is the whole part of why it's so hard to make a living doing what I do, doing what you do. You see, we are we are quickly labeled as uh, conspiracy theorists, tinfoil hat wearers, and you know because we're giving people real information. You know, and that's why I make the comment: there isn't a lot of money in the truth. Um, you know, pouring gasoline on a fire and cheer, cheerleading stock market higher, so long as the stock market continues to go higher, you look like a hero. I mean, you know, my 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 my, my I guess my real response to that question would be: uh, the person who submitted the question should probably watch the movie The Big Short. Because the big, the big short, basically, deals with that. And uh, but I mean, is 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 there is there a fast and ready solution to what we're encountering? It's it's hard to say. You know, the question the question that was posed is a lot like saying, if you were a Jew in Nazi Germany, what should you do? I mean, maybe you should leave. I'm, I you know I you know. It's it's uh, you know with hindsight we know that that's not a good place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, if if you're if you're caught in the here and now of it, what do you do? Do you hide? Do, uh, do you know? Uh, is is complaining is complaining or, or writing letters to the editor in the Berlin newspaper going to help you? Uh, probably not. But I mean, you know. There's there's a there's a there's there's an acronym that's 
widely associated with the crypto markets. It's if you know the term HODL. Don't. You don't know the term HODL? Sorry. H-O-D-L. It's called Hold On For Dear Life. It's a wild ride. It's a, it's a wild, scary ride. And, you know, maybe you HODL and you, uh, and you start praying. I don't know. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. So I'm not going to say I have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. I just know at the end of the day that you can't fool Mother Nature forever. Hmm. And when Mother Nature uh, uh, reasserts herself, there will be hell to pay. And best you be positioned the right way the day that occurs. Again, we don't, uh, neither we nor our guests give personalized financial advice. So what we're talking about are principles here that people can consider. Similar comments would apply to this. Next question, Lawful Money asks, Mr. Kirby, if someone had a large sum of cash and a bloated 401k sitting in, quote, stable value funds, where would be the safest place to put it in preparation for the econo coming economic disaster? Again, just speaking in general principles. Well, I mean, uh, on the, on, I mean, in a, a 401k, for instance, is, is a registered plan where it's very, it's very, it can be very costly to uh, collapse a 401k and, 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 and you would, and you would probably suffer, uh, especially if it was bloated. And if you had a lot of money outside, which probably would mean you've got some sort of a substantial income, um, you know, to, to avert triggering a very negative tax event, you might want to consider uh, putting some funds into a reputable, uh, possibly metals fund. Put, and I'm not saying all of it. I'm saying some of it. Uh, and when I say a reputable precious metals fund, I don't mean GLD or SLV. I think those are frauds. Uh, but there, there are a number of places that where, where you can you can buy uh, physical backed uh, gold and silver funds yep. uh, that are uh, registered plan eligible. Yep. Uh, I know Sprott offers such yep. a, such a thing. Um, BMG, a company I've been associated with mm -hmm. at, at times, they offer such a thing. Um, and I know that there are uh, purveyors in, in America that offer offer this as well. Um, you know, you might want to check with, uh, uh, boy, I'm trying to remember the names. Uh, Miles Franklin, I think, probably ha could can direct you uh, on the registered side. And then, and then on the outside, the registered funds, like uh, in terms of your, uh, you know, your your cash holdings. Mm -hmm. You know, you should you should probably have some of that invested in precious metals as well. Uh, you, 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 if you if you're familiar with and have a good understanding of the cryptoverse, you might want to consider owning a little bit of crypto. Uh, and I don't think you necessarily have to have a whole lot invested there, but maybe maybe a little something in something. And I wish I felt qualified enough to to, you know suggest one uh, but i don't understand the cryptoverse enough to pick winners uh, like i don't i don't feel qualified hmm. to to advise on specific cryptos my, my my hunch would be that a likely a likely survivor long term probably will be bitcoin only because it's the biggest uh it's the biggest cryptocurrency on the planet right now but you see, and the reason I'm reluctant to name cryptocurrencies that I think will do well is that the, the space is quite young. And I do believe that cryptos will be a much bigger part of our lives in future years. I just don't know which ones are going to be the ones that rise to the very top. I, I've mentioned so, this before. When you visit the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, there's the walk through the 20th century. All these different automobiles by all these different makers are out there. And there's one big display board that's about waist high. You look at it, and it's a very fine print. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names. 
Most of them are in gray and only a very few are in white. The ones that are in gray are automobile manufacturers that went out of business in the 20th century and the few that are in white are the ones that are still in business. And you bet even when they made that board, the Tesla doesn't appear anywhere on it and it's the number one uh, <laughs> you know, a market cap company now. Yeah, that's right. So, there, and that's a great example. So, I mean, you know, it, it, 20 years ago, who had heard of Tesla? It didn't exist. And now it's the largest market cap automobile manufacturer on the planet, I believe. Yeah, just recently. So, uh, you know, so like, you know, and, and could could we in five or ten years be saying the same thing about uh, Bitcoin? You know, Bitcoin, like General Motors used to be the biggest. General Motors was the biggest market cap company in the world at one point. I mean, followed closely by General Electric. And where are they now? I mean, you know, I, I think they've both been eliminated from the Dow 30. <laughs> so, I mean, all I'm saying, it's amazing how uh, things can change in a very short period of time, which is why I'm so reluctant to try to name. I think there are cryptocurrencies that will be huge five years from now that don't even exist today. Mm. So... How can I pick something that hasn't yet, you know, it's sort of like saying in 20 years, you know, Tesla is going to be the biggest car company. Well, how can you make a statement when it, when the company doesn't exist? Hmm. You, you literally can't. Hmm. So anyway, but it, it, it bears watching and paying attention to, because you might, you might, if you've got a sharp eye and if you've got a good understanding and if you're well read on the, on, on the space, you know, you might notice something. Uh, where where you know maybe you don't go bet your bet your life savings on, but something that you maybe can take a, a very very small position in a mad money. It's like just remember people, if you had taken if you had taken a very very small amount of money, a couple hundred bucks, and put it into Microsoft when Bill Gates was operating out of a garage, and bought some Microsoft stock, you'd be a billionaire today. So you know, and if you'd bought some Bitcoin when it was a dollar. Uh, you'd still be doing pretty well. So, you know, the funny thing is, you know, I'm I'm not ashamed to say, like, I had people tell me to buy Bitcoin when it was under a dollar, and I laughed at them. And they're laughing back now. Yeah. So there you go. That's life. We've got a question here you may or may not uh, have information on. Uh, we Never Wanted Tyranny asks, Hey, Rob, thanks for everything you do. We truly appreciate you. I have been accumulating precious metals for a little while now, and it just as, and just would like your thoughts on: Is there any chance that salted or I assume adulterated metals could wind up in places like? And he mentioned some major dealers. Uh, how much cash would be? Okay, that's what. That's question number one. Is it possible that that adulterated metals could end up in major dealerships that you might purchase from? Well, uh, do I think it can happen? I think it. I think it's possible to happen. Um, um, I, I know that adulterated metals exist in the in the let's just say in the very large wholesale markets. I know that I know that and completely believe that there's a substantial amount of uh, tungsten bars coated in gold that are siloed in the in the in the in the very large market. It wouldn't surprise me if if a number of countries have in their national vaults tungsten bars coated in gold. I truly believe, and uh, I truly believe that this is the case, but I look at it from the standpoint, most people that would be listening to this would be of a, more of a retail ilk. I feel very comfortable owning gold maples, gold eagles, uh, uh, gold Krugerrands. Um, the, 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 Let's just let's just say the effort that goes into making uh, uh, and stamping, uh, uh, for instance, a, a, a tungsten uh, gold eagle would be extremely difficult mm -hmm. because like uh, tungsten to begin with, tungsten melts at a temperature that uh, most places don't even have the ability to melt. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, 
if, if you're buying gold eagles from a reputable dealer, gold maples from a reputable dealer, you can be you can you can be you could sleep very well at night knowing that you've got gold. Uh, if if I was buying 400 ounce bars that I hadn't assayed, I would be concerned. Okay. I would want to have those assayed before I would ever purchase them. Fair enough. Gold eagles from gold eagles, gold maples, gold Kruger ants from a reputable uh, uh, dealer. I don't think you have an issue. Rob, we're going to have to end it there because we are up against the clock, but uh, just grateful for this time you spent with us. Folks, those of you who submitted questions that I didn't get time to ask, we will try to get Rob on again as soon as we can arrange our schedules. We've been speaking with Rob Kirby, founder of KirbyAnalytics.com, where you can go and support Rob and his breakthrough work where he unabashedly and fearlessly proclaims what's really going on to us. And also, uh, guys, support us at patreon.com slash reluctant preppers. Thanks for joining us, Rob. Been my pleasure, Duncan. They say the stock market crashed today. Yeah, I heard that. Sounds like people's retirement accounts and savings accounts are going to get bailed into the banks. Yeah. Looks like Pension plans and social security are going to get suspended too. I know. Sure, I'm glad we decided to put our money into gold and silver instead. Me too. Get your gold and silver and support this channel at goldsilver.com slash question mark AFF equals RP. Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. Yeah.